I know I've already talked about um, echocardiogram, so let's review. Echocardiogram is an ultrasound, so here's a cartoon-like picture of a patient receiving an echocardiogram. Then to the right, that's kind of what your ultrasound picture is going to look like. This is used to evaluate the valves and their function, um, chamber sizes, ventricle muscle, and septal motion. So there's multiple things, and specifically ejection fracture. Um, there is controversy as to whether or not an echocardiogram is the best way to diagnose um, pulmonary artery hypertension. Um, you can measure that pulmonary artery, um, but some will say a right heart catheterization is the best way to do it. But just know that this will lead doctors to know that there's a problem and then they may choose to do further diagnostic testing. Also, as far as least invasive, least expensive, this is obviously um, less, least invasive and least expensive than the next slide, which is a picture of a cardiac catheterization. So this may be something that they choose to do um, immediately versus trying to go in for the heart cath. Okay, so cardiac catheterization, um, you can read more about this in your book if you're interested. You could probably also look on YouTube for tutorials or information about how a cardiac catheterization is done. Um, cardiac cath is an, invas is an invasive procedure, so this is something that requires a patient signed consent. The doctor needs to explain um, risks involved in having this procedure done. This is um, kind of a picture this shows you. It's a sterile procedure here on the left. It shows the doctor, um, the patients there covered up in that darker blue um, sterile drape. And there's technicians involved. You know, the doctor accesses um, the vein and the artery to go in to get looks of the heart. Um, you can see the pictures on the right um, are actual pictures. So that dark is the actual artery that they've put dye through to kind of light up so that they can see where there's an occlusion or where there's a, a problem happening. Um, so they go into the artery um, and it just gives them really detailed visual pictures of what's going on. Um, they're able to go in, they can get pulmonary artery pressures, they can get um, central venous pressures, I mean, they can go in and get numbers and get an idea of how the heart really is, not only for occlusion, but for the flow of the butt blood. Um, patients that have this, because it's going into an artery, um, it's going in uh, venous and through arterial, so you want to check for pulses on the affected leg. So if they go in through the right groin, they're going to want to be checking for signs and symptoms of bleeding. Um, circulation, uh, distal pulses. So if you can feel pulses in the feet, then you know that blood flow is getting through from the arterial site in the groin. They will have um, activity restrictions. They'll need to lay flat for a time. They'll need a, a nursing staff will have to apply pressure for a time. And then um, I think it's, I don't have it in my notes. I want to say it's up to six hours of limited um, movement. Um, once they get in there and, and access that artery. I already mentioned this in a previous slide, but this is just pictures of how um, a stress test is done. So you see this man here on the treadmill. He's hooked up to all the cardiac monitors. The um, nurse there is doing a blood pressure. Then they also um, draw cardiac enzymes. Remember how we talked about enzymes at the beginning, how um, they elevate, it can take um, four to six hours for them to start to trend upward. So this patient may have the stress test done, they may have um, labs drawn, and then if they do well and there's no symptoms, they may send them to go to a lab later that day to have more blood work done. Um, they also do this with medications, like a nuclear stress test or, uh, I don't know what the other name is for off the top of my head, but like a chemical stress test. And I think that that's what that picture on the top right um, is of. It's possibly a chemical stress test. So they chemically induce complications for your heart to see how your body responds to it as well.
transesophageal echocardiogram. As you can see in this picture, um, it's just a different approach or a different closer picture to the heart. Um, the TEE provides a higher quality picture than a regular echocardiogram. Throat is anesthetized and a flexible scope is passed through the esophagus to the level of the heart. Um, patients have conscious sedation. So the, the nurse um, who's assisting here, which would be essentially your role, right, to sit here and, and monitor the patient, assess, check for their airway, make sure you're medicating them, um, you're not over medicating them, but you're just trying to induce a cooperative state. Um, the TE, the esophagus lies right behind the heart and um, can, you can get more detailed view from there. You can see the cardiac structures of the mitral valve, um, the left H, uh, atrium. These patients need to be NPO. This is an invasive procedure, so they need to sign consent for this as well. Um, and this is what a transesophageal echocardiogram. If you are more curious or want to see, again, feel free to Google. Um, and you can probably find some pretty educational videos on YouTube about the process of a transesophageal echocardiogram. Okay, class, I realize that you just got a lot of information in regards to cardiac. Um, I'm kind of, um, I like to draw pictures and explain things and do more visuals, so um, I know that you guys will have questions based on the PowerPoint. So keep track of them. I encourage you um, to, like I said, first do your reading. While you're doing your reading, answer those study guide questions that I emailed to you. Um, as you're answering that, and that's done and your reading is done, then sit down and listen to this lecture. Listen to the PowerPoint and really try to start to apply what you've learned. So when you, we come to class and we come together, um, we'll be working through case studies. So you will have all of this knowledge. We'll have some time to answer questions in case there's any confusion or anything needs to be clarified or explained in more detail. Um, so we'll answer the, those questions and then we'll work through those case studies so that you can take all of this knowledge that you've studied and worked on and then you can actually apply it um, in an in, in almost real life situation. And then um, hopefully when you get to clinical and as you progress through adult health too and so on, you'll be able to build from this. We, you know, fluid and electrolytes are very important and you can see the importance I think a lot when you get through the cardiac lecture on how fluid and electrolytes balance. You know, the whole cardiac lecture talks about this pump and what happens when there's complications associated with it. And this whole pump moves those fluid and electrolytes through. So I think that these two um, do go hand in hand and they are complicated. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, then you should have registered your book. <coughs> I encourage you to go on there and when you're done with these three chapters to go to the NCLEX style questions at the end of each chapter is on your resources. And I want to say there's about 10 questions or so per chapter and practice those questions to see if you um, retained enough information to be successful in those chapters. And let me know if you have questions. I'm sorry you've had to listen to my annoying voice for, I don't know how long this PowerPoint is, but I imagine it's pretty long. So um, I hope you find it interesting. I hope you've learned something. Come to class prepared with any questions or clarifications that you need. And um, thank you all for taking the time to listen to the PowerPoint.